that was the hardest part of this whole thing. It was making sure that everyone else was good, which is what we do as entrepreneurs. We put so many people above ourselves. We pay people above ourselves. You know, we'll take the L. We'll stay up till 2 a.m. No one sees the back end of all of this. No, no. And it was like dealing with, I think I need to do something else with also, you know, how can I let all these people down? Letting people down. But then also like, I also need to manage my own burnout. Y'all, welcome to another episode of Rich in Real Life. I am here with a truly incredible guest, a founder, an author, a data and storytelling expert, the host of the Road to Reinvention podcast. But the true reason why I have her here today is not because of her accolades and the gold stars. This woman is incredible and you can look her up and it will tell you all the things. (laughs) But what I want to talk about today is her story of impact reinvention Mm -hmm. and deciding how purposeful, impactful you want to be and allowing the pivot in that. And I think that's so important for everybody listening. So without further ado, I am going to introduce you to one of my absolute favorite people personally and professionally, Sherelle Dorsey. Thank you for having me, Jess. You know, I love you the long way. (laughs) (laughs) So much so. And so here's here's where I have to start with the internet internetting right now. Everybody is trying to tell us what to do. The internet be internetting. Yeah, <laughs> it does. And it's like, here's all the ways that you should be doing things, the ways you can get rich, the ways that you can get ahead, the ways yeah. that you can be seen, authority, make your opinion, your point, blah, 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 blah. I respect you so much because I think you have so much opportunity in front of you, mm-hmm. but I watch you time and time again make choices that you're like, I'm going to do things that are impactful. I'm going to do things that solve world problems. I'm going to yeah. do things that actually help people. And it's kind of like you just drown out the noise and you're like, I'm going to do the things that matter. This is why yeah. I am here. So much so that you just released yeah. a baby. Yeah. You just dropped a baby off. Baby gone. Gone. Baby just gone. dropped it off. The baby's gone. <laughs> a seven year business. Yeah. And 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 this is gonna come from someone that I'm in my year four. Yeah. Boy, this shit is hard. Yep. What made you let this baby go? Oh. And how did you know you made the right decision? Gosh, I don't even know if I made the right decision. <laughs> um I I, like, 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 like time will tell. Right. Right. You know, I think for me, sometimes you have those, those moments in life, whether it's like a breakup or a move to a new city or changing a job, you kind of just know when it's time for you to transition. Yeah. And I think I woke up maybe a year prior to making the decision and I realized. Can I highlight real quick what that yeah. decision was? Because I think I jumped right in head first. Yeah, yeah. You sold your company. Yeah, I sold my company. Um, and it was a part of realizing it was time for me to let it go. Mm. That I had reached the pinnacle of the work in that particular medium. Like this is as good as it's going to get. This is, and not even just this is as good as it's going to get. This is as good as I'm going to get in terms of adding value through Mm -hmm. this medium. And the problem that I was trying to solve was creating data-driven, smart, interesting, investigative, long-form reporting on Black innovation. Mm. And what I had seen out there in the world had been either performative or we got into this like content mill of content, which is just kind of what just has defined like the internet around sound bites and copy and pasted press releases. And we call that news. Mm. And I wanted to get back to the art of storytelling and interesting ways in which to find information and make it accessible to people. Mm. And I did that and I got to really lift up the work of incredible journalists, like actual journalists, people who picked up the phone to call and verify information, people who searched databases. I wanted the art of the work to be, I don't don't even want to call it like this kind of purity sense, but a sense of like, 
journal what journalism is because journalism and media are two different things. Yes. And we veered so far away from that. Yes. And I wanted to return to what is the craft? What is the actual craft? And people who dedicate their lives, they go to school for this or, you know, they work in newsrooms day in and day out to get information factual. And I wanted to do it in a way that really could take something that folks weren't doing, which was collecting Black innovation research and data and making it available to investors, to, um, you know, public entities, governments, so that they could use it to make smart decisions about how the world looked at and saw the design of innovation hubs that were sorely missing folks of color or were so sorely missing women. And I did that in a seven year span. I got right out of grad school. And part of the reason why I even launched the plug was I was in grad school with a thesis talking about I wanted to examine Black innovation data and Black innovation movements, but I couldn't because the data was not accessible. So I'm in class in a data journalism program at Columbia University with a thesis that I cannot deliver on. Mm. So I had to go back and use my class assignments to develop data sets and do man like the manual work of collecting information, looking at articles, verifying information, making phone calls, creating surveys to build out my own data sets. And then from there, I had a partnership with Vice and I started just publishing. What are the fastest growing black owned co-working spaces? What, what doing a map of black led tech conferences since the 1970s? Like all these things where people didn't even ask these questions publicly and at newsrooms all. were not checking for them. And so the stories would go viral. I got a ton of attention and I got to the point where it was like, it's either now or never. I'm going to build the Black Jump. Bloomberg or I'm just going to sit down and continue to complain about getting really shitty information on p- Black people in business. Because right. I don't want to just, I don't want to be inspired. I want to learn strategically how to build a company and how these people who come from communities like I come from, may have had a background like me, how they were able to build partnerships, hire teams, you know, build the kind of technology that they were building. I wanted to see that so that we weren't just referring to Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk all the damn time yeah. around innovation. Right. Because there are plenty of people around me who were building really dope things. Right. So I did that. You know, we we had so many feats from major partnerships with Fast Company to being the first black business publication to syndicate on the Bloomberg Terminal. Like all the things even greater than I imagined that we could have done. And incredible partners, Fortune 500 clients and and Fortune 1000 clients, you know, just helped people raise tens of thousands of dollars, helped incubators and accelerators become created, helped to advise the Chamber of Commerce, like all of these different entities. And then I looked up one day and I was like, all right, that was cool. We could do more of this for the next five, 10 years. We could, you know, slowly grow grow our newsroom. We could raise more money, which venture capital is not that friendly to VC. We could, you know, start chasing event money, you know, and doing all the things. I'm like, but that takes away the core of the actual craft of the journalism and the storytelling. And what if we just take this work and let another media entity that is deeply invested in the future of an impactful investment world take on take take this to the next to the next the next level Mm -hmm. right we built up hbcu and future of the work data narratives we did the deep dives on education data and endowments like all of those things were great and then it's like now what what's next we can keep producing or we can solve the next problem and the next problem for me is what happens when you do not have a repository of black innovation data to help make strong business financial decisions as you're going into new ecosystems and emerging markets. So that's kind of some of the thinking that I'm working on now in the background. So data still at its core, but now my thing is how do I build something that can literally redefine how insights practitioners and data practitioners think about any kind of market data Mm. that exists outside of the status quo? How do I solve for that? Because that's a bigger problem. And if in 
50 years or 80 years when I'm gone, they're working with the tools that I established, then I have contributed so much more to the practice of research and to the practice of data analysis and financial systems and the way people think and and, in case studies that become much more diverse. And then in turn, entire ecosystems, entire communities that get funding. Like I'm, I'm thinking like long-term around the stream of systems that can fundamentally be changed by the information that I'm sharing, but it's not through the same medium as the plug. It's through something else. I realized like, okay, it's time for me to move on. I have outgrown this. Mm. I've enjoyed it. I've loved my team. It was the hardest thing, Jessica, because I, I was know. identified by it. I was identified. Like you run the plug. You're the founder of the plug. Everywhere I went, you're the plug. And then all of a sudden, the it's like- The literal plug. Right, the literal <laughs> plug. And it's like, now, now what do you say? What do you say when you're like, I don't do that anymore? And like, people think you're a failure. Like people literally like reach out, like, do you need money? Are you okay? I can help you pay your bills if you can. I'm like, no, I literally just decided I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I can say, I don't want to do this anymore. Correct. I can say like, this was enough. And now as a multifaceted person who sees a host of problems in the world, I want to go work on, I'm going to wake up every day and be excited and geeked out about the next thing that I want to build. I spent seven years on that. And this was not the first company that I sold. This was the second one. I sold another company three, four years prior called Black Tech Charlotte. Black Tech Charlotte was a great concept. It was a hub of opportunity to connect Black techies across North Carolina, and particularly within Charlotte. And at some point I had to decide, like, am I going to do this or am I going to do the plug? And now it's like, am I going to do the plug or am I going to do these next things? Am I going to apply my skills and my talents and everything that I learned and now create something even more robust and purposeful because that is the calling that is, that's on my life. Or I can rest on my laurels and I can just do more of the same and brainlessly and, you know, speak here, post a picture here, send an email there. I could do that, but that's not helpful. So anyway, I just said lots of words, but <laughs> do y'all see why I'm, why I'm so in love? Like I'm oh my gosh. so in love. I feel love. like I just rambled off a bunch of words. No. <laughs> oh my God. I'm Girl. Oh my God. <laughs> you just like give me energy and I'm like mm. literally in love because there's so many things here. One, I'm like, this is true entrepreneurship. Yeah. This is true entrepreneurship. Like I've always said that entrepreneurship was created so that there wasn't a financial ceiling. And yeah. without that financial ceiling, a women, women especially, I think, mm -hmm. is that we have the space to then decide what we want to do. Yeah. And entrepreneurship was always really like, I think you know Gamal, but he always says this, like you create the thing, you grow the thing, you grow the ass, and then you sell it. Yeah. Like that's what you're actually supposed and you move to on do. To the next thing. And like, you move on to we, the next thing. As entrepreneurs, thing. we talk about people who work in the same job for 10, 20 years and wait to retire. And it's like, yeah, but sometimes it's time to retire from your business. And whether you've, you know, hit the major number that you wanted to sell it at, like sometimes a thing is done and it's okay to say that it's done and you're ready for the next thing. It's totally fine. I want to go back to this feeling yeah. just for a second. You wake up, you have something. It has momentum. It's powerful. You are yeah. known for this thing. It is your identity. Yeah. While it, it might have been an overnight feeling, like it's like you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm actually over someone. I don't think about them anymore. Like it was not, it might have been an overnight feeling. It wasn't an overnight decision. No, because you still have to plan. You still have to, to figure out what do I have left to do to get this to a place where I feel like, I can exit on top, right? Mm -hmm. We've released the Black Tech Effect Report. We had done an analysis of Black-led tech companies and did kind of the top 100 based on impact, um, really looking at the stats around not just what they raise or the revenue, but also how many jobs do they create? Um, in what ways were they disrupting industries? That report that was spearheaded by my director of research at the time, Taylor James, like completely went viral. Mm. You know, and I mean accessed by major corporate companies who are like, oh, we didn't know about a lot of these companies and we are going to reach out because we want to invest in them. And so for me, it was, you still have to bow out gracefully. Yeah. And 
it, cause it was more than just me. It was more than just Sherelle saying, all right, it's a wrap. Let me go ahead and disconnect my accounts. It was, I have a whole team. I have a team that I'm responsible for. Like that was not easy mm-hmm. to have that conversation. And there were lots of tears. There were lots of tears because, and then that's the second guessing, right? It's like, yeah. should I break up? Should I not? <laughs> yeah. And am I making a bad decision? Am I making a bad, am I going to regret this? Yeah. And Are we right before the thing that's the biggest thing? And you have to have the faith that that feeling that you're waking up with every day and you're like, this is no longer what I'm supposed to be doing. There's something more. You have to honor that. And you can still gracefully make the transition, you know, inform the people who are going to be most affected, you know, slowly start to scale down certain things or scale up depending on what your goals are having conversations with different buyers that were interested, um, you know, ultimately deciding to to work with a partner that, you know, we'd had a really strong rapport and we had the same core values around fundamentally really great journalism, mm. S- just superb journalism. And you have to push your ego aside as well because there, especially I think in the, in the tech space and um, in entrepreneurship in general, you know, there's just so much of the performative nature of what success may look like. And I had to realize that I need to be okay with not having this name behind me anymore and sharing and explaining that I actually don't have to explain. I'm going to share this with you. But at the end of the day, like my choice is my choice. And I know that there are other things that I need to do. I fundamentally have become a different person. You know, before it was like, I'm at every conference. I'm reporting. I'm on stages. I'm, you know, bumming an Airbnb with my bestie to like sneak into South by Southwest. Like I remember those early grind days, like the passion, the drive, the stories that went viral and people would get pissed off because I would tell the truth. And when I think about it, I never thought the plug would be a thing. It was just something I was doing because I was working things out in my own mind and in my own sense of discovery. Right. And others started rocking with me. Now, what I will say is the wind down in the emails and the outreach that I got. And I remember I was talking to another founder and I I said, you know, it was almost like being present at my own funeral to hear what people have to say. To hear what people have to say, what people really rock with you. And there were people who were, you know, subscriber number 100, who had followed for years. Folks who were just like, we are going to miss you so much. Right. But we're so grateful for what you did and the impact that you had. Like, I'm still responding to emails because there were so many and I had to take some time off just to kind of recoup and to kind of get back in balance. And like I said, I think the biggest thing was at first it was, how do I do this and not feel like I'm losing part of my identity? Because now how do I show up in spaces, right? Like what context will I lose now that I don't have this as the platform? Because a lot of my relationships were based on, I can deliver or at least make a mention of what it is that you might do, right? That was my currency. My social currency was through the publication that I had. Right. The second thing, which was really just the hardest was, I have to make sure my team lands well because they are phenomenal. And how do I ensure their success and give them enough time to make a transition? Especially when I'm starting to wind up some of these other things, but I'm not sure what's going to happen with them. And I would love to bring them over, but I can't can't, make any promises. I can't make promises. And I'm not, and I've I've never been a person who's going to promise something to a team member, anyone that I brought on that I could not deliver on. And that was always my speech whenever I, I hired someone. It's like, look, this is where we are today. Here's where I'm looking to go. But right now, this is what we have today. I'm not going to promise you anything that I don't have. And once we have more, then we can talk about your elevation. That was the hardest part of this whole thing. It was making sure that everyone else was good, which is what we do as entrepreneurs. We put so many people above ourselves. We pay people above ourselves. We'll take the L. We'll stay up till 2 a.m. No one sees the back end of all of this. No, no. And it was like dealing with, I think I need to do something else with also, you know, how can I let all these people down, letting people down. But then also like, I also need to manage my own burnout. 
And this is going to be years of recovery, by the way. Years. Years of recovery because it's not just a trip to the spa. No. It's not just a breathing exercise. None of that could save me. None of those things. And it's like, it really is. I have the weight of the world. I have to get this done. The economic climate is insane. Racism is real. You really realize like, oh, after George Floyd, all of a sudden there was this deluge of opportunity. And now that everyone's scaling back because there might be a recession or there may not be. And then you're like, I'm going to have to work twice as hard now just to get us to where we were. Right. And in order to expand, it keeps getting harder and harder. it's getting harder. And in order to expand, I'm going to have to go into avenues that are not true to why I started this in the first place. And so instead of try to fight that uphill battle and use energy, mental, physical, emotional energy that I didn't have because I wanted to allocate that to what I was starting to see was my next thing. It was like, all right, this clearly is no longer viable. How can I do this the least painfully as possible and the least in the most humane? Because sometimes like startups will shut down on a Tuesday. And you'll walk into work or you'll log into work and that's it. No one gives you a two week notice. And I did my best to ensure, like to have a conversation with my team. Here's, here's what, here's what's going on. Here's what we're going to have to do. Here's how much time I'm giving us. And then you're also talking to some of your investors the thing that also I think really saved me was I didn't raise any money until year six. Wow. We were subsiding off of revenue, our partnerships, recurring monthly revenue from our subscribers, as well as some grants. And I mean, I was able to even like get essentially subsidized employees because I was able to source from um, foundation partners and um, organizations that were working to help place talent and would help to subsidize some of the salaries. So I always moved lean and very scrappy because I was like, look, if this goes to bus, I ain't trying to be out here right. catching hands in the streets right. because Correct. somebody's like, I need my money. Right. You know, so the other part of the conversation was like, I had to talk to investors. I'm like, hey, listen, here's what's here's here's what it is. Here's what here are all the things I did well. Here are the things I think that I didn't do so well on. Um, but the the horizon would have to look like this. And I am not willing, nor am I equipped to do that. Because that's outside of my scope. It's outside of the scope of the vision that I had for this particular entity. And every single investor was just like, we are so proud of you. Mm. We are so proud of you. Mm -hmm. We thought you were phenomenal. Let us know what we can do to help you. And I was mm. like, I need, I need you to place my team. I have phenomenal people that like have worked for me and like they need to go into the next level of their work because they grew so much here. Like I put my team through the fire and they came out like freaking bosses. Right. And I'm like, I just need you to take care of my team. That's it. I'm cool. Cause I'm going to go to the Bahamas. <laughs> I'm going to go rest. I'm about to go chill. Right. I'm about to go chill and I'm about to go walk in the park barefoot and be on chill. But the emotional side is always the people. And then getting the replies and responses and the outreach and the phone calls. Like you look at my phone now, there's still people that, you know, I, I'm like, I have to still get back to you. Yeah. And people like just this, this whole journey has built some of the most amazing relationships. It's grown me the most. It has taught me so much. And I feel like even though I was leaving something for the people who really rocked with me, it was like, we can't wait to see what you do next. Right. Cause they're like, Oh yeah, we, we already know. We know, we know Where, wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you touch, it's going to be gold and it's going to be mission driven. It's going to be impactful. It's going to be authentic. Yes. We know that you're going to deliver us something absolutely stellar. Yes. And so it was like validation, but heartbreak, like just every day you wake up and you have no idea. Both. Yeah. And then I had like friends or mentors who had also either sold or, you know, shut down or whatever it is. And they're like, look, if you ever want to talk, you know, let's, let's have the conversation. Like you said earlier, it's going to take a long time to really process through all of it because yeah. there was so much good. And then there was so much challenge and so much reality about 
the world and how it operates and how unfairly it operates, Mm -hmm. no matter what your credentials, no matter how good you are, sometimes it doesn't matter that your pitch was stellar or you had the right thing. Sometimes you have the right thing at the wrong time or you have the wrong thing at the right Right time. time. And some of this is just about a matter of luck, right? Yes. And relationships. Which you were stellar at. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like I did. I did everything that I knew how to do. And I thought, I think I did a really phenomenal job at it with a few hiccups here and there, but I stayed so true to not wanting to add to the plethora of junk in the world Mm. and trying to change a narrative in the newsroom and in this space of technology that would never name someone like myself as genius or anybody else that we featured or covered as genius. And for me, it was opening the eyes now of of newsrooms that used to license our content who finally built out divisions themselves on Black business stories that aren't fluff and magical minority stories. Right. It took out at least six or seven years from since we started to see that, yeah, we want deeply reported significant narratives as well. So I was like, we actually have accomplished our work. We wanted to change the way that tech in business was, was reporting. Reported. We did it. We're done. Goodbye. I'm going to the Bahamas. <laughs> like, all right. Next up. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Your email of exit, whatever you want to call it, was yeah. most, the most beautifully written email. And there was just the cadence of it. I could hear your voice mm. when you explained how proud of you, yourself you were. Then you went into all of the highlights of everything you guys have accomplished, which was obviously award winning and noteworthy, yeah. beyond noteworthy. There was two things that I just cannot get out of my <laughs> head. You were like, this is our formal communication. There will be no more communication after this. You will hear from someone else. Yeah. And you were like, and as far as me, here's what I plan to do. I'm going to go rest. Yeah. And I'm going to go focus on me. Yeah. And eventually I'm going to go focus on something else that matters. But right now I'm going to focus on me. I'm going to focus on me. And I was like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like, and yes, in the sense of like, yes to you for sitting in that. Mm. Like, yes to you for saying I did a bomb thing and I don't need to report to you that I'm doing another bomb thing as the reason to why I'm walking away from this. I'm going to stop and rest. And I'm going to celebrate myself Yeah, because I did something really dope that changed the world. Yeah, And I'm going to do something dope again because there will be new iterations of me Yeah, and how I impact the world. But right now, mama's going to take a break. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to go catch up on all the things I didn't do. Yeah. I'm going to be, I'm going to enjoy love. Mm -hmm. I'm going to rest. That's it. I'm going to connect. I'm going to get married. I might have some babies, whatever I choose to do. But I'm going to go look back at my reflection and spend some time with me. That's it. What's what's wild, too, is that same week, I think two days before my announcement, I had another friend who stepped down from her company. Um, and then two days later, there's another friend who stepped down from hers. And it was just like a string of of women, like very high achieving, incredible, who were like, yeah, we're good. We're going to just take some time. I'm done here for now. Yeah, I'm done for now. I'm done for now. It was funny because I think someone sent me a message. They're like, okay, y'all can't be doing this to us all week. All all together at once. This is is too much. All at one time. Like, was this a coordinated effort? And I was like, no, I think that there is a consciousness and and an awareness that is being established around. We speak so much about hustle culture. And I think that we've defined hustle culture as this like toxic thing. And I think we have to remember that especially I think for millennials and kind of that transition of the loss of security in this country, it wasn't really hustle. Like, because I think when we talk about hustle culture, it's something you opt into. The reality is that like we had to. Right. Right. I mean, like when I graduated from college and lost my first job right out of, right out of school because of the recession, it was like, okay, no, I have to do four and five things at the same time. And continue to keep income coming in. Correct. And I have to be the best. And also people weren't providing full-time jobs with benefits. 
-hmm. rental prices continued to go up. Mm -hmm. Like all of these factors made it very challenging to find a footing. So by default, many of us did become entrepreneurs. Correct. Right? Because the the degrees at this point now, everybody had a degree. Like you weren't special. No. So you had to have a blog or some form that that differentiated you in the marketplace. And that means being highly visible. Everything was about performative. Look what I know. Look what I, where I've been. Look what I'm doing. Correct. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. And also, please pay me. Yes. Because I want to eat. And so it, it came out of this sense of, no, you can't. You have to be team no sleep because you're attempting to, to survive. Right? And on top of that, we talk about software eating the world. And we got the degrees and now we have the student loans to pay back at high interest rates. So there's so many other factors that like we have to remember we're a part of the change in society of not having true safety nets. Mm. And so once you've reached a certain level of success, you've been able to pay yourself well, you're finally able to be on good footing and you've established yourself in a way that you command a higher dollar amount on anything that you do. Now it's like, I actually have not had a moment to just be still. So I'm going to go and now be still. Mm. And with that stillness, when I build my next thing, I'm going to do it so drastically different because now I have the option and the choice too. Mm. And I think with more- Creating out a choice and not scarcity. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Because the first part is survival, which I mean, every business you're starting, you're, 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 you're going into a survival mode because every day is a fight in business. Right. You know, you've got to close the deal. You've got to sustain. You've got to, you know, you, you've got to keep going and growing. But that's very different when you're talking about business survival versus personal survival. Those are two different motivations. And so now when you're able to say, okay, I have the contacts, I have the relationships. I know how to get contracts. I know how to pitch. I know how to close. I know how to manage money better. I know how to hire better. I can take all these lessons and do this again. But now I can cut my curve time in half. So in, instead of and, seven, I can do this in two. And I also know that I don't have to be the person that is clicking all the buttons. Correct. That now I can pluck this person. I can hire this person. I can do X, Y, and Z. And ta-da, I have the something. Thing. I have the thing that I want and I have exerted but better, so much less of effort. But it better be some shit I really want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to be enthusiastic. And and that was the thing, you know, and we, we've spoken about this a lot. It was just like, I just woke up and was like, I'm not excited about this. They're all the same stories now. Yeah. Yes. No one's, no one is yes. creating, like there's maybe one out of every 20 people is doing something that can fundamentally change the world. Wow. And everyone else seems to be replications of each other. Correct. There's nothing fascinating Unique. there anymore. So I want to go and be in fascinating spaces. I want to be in these environments where people are talking about literally training up the next workforce of green energy workers. I want to be in those spaces where people are removing carbon dioxide from the world and turning it into stone or taking and, and separating protein and turning it into meat. Like just fascinating things that are trying to solve some of our greatest challenges mm -hmm. related to ocean, air, water, um, you know, energy as a whole. Sustainability. All going, ongoing sustainability, natural disasters, um, and putting together a workforce of people who can now be trained in those spaces because we need downstream effects, right? We need folks who are not going to get a degree. Maybe they'll go get a trade certification yep. and they can be, you know, leveraged at one end of the supply chain to ensure a functioning society. And those kinds of systems are really fascinating to me. And, you know, part of me is like, I want to be able to feed into those systems. I want to just be inspired by human ingenuity. Mm. Everything else to me is mundane. Yeah. And it may be sexy, but I think about the downstream effects. How many more cosmetic lines do we need? How many more tubes and jars and, you know, bottles? need to end up in the ocean, ocean because we're not thinking about the fact by 2050 we'll have more plastic in the ocean than fish right and fish are eating plastic and then we eat the fish and then plastic in our bodies which is full of chemicals and then we think about cancers Cancer. and going on a cancer walk 
is not going to help us solve the root issues, which are we do not have a sustainable way in which to recycle because we continue to produce raw materials and our waste cycle does not create new opportunities to take all of this and do something and, and, and put it back into the world at scale, right? At scale. Yep. Because there's a lot of great experiments. Ideas. Yeah. And ideas yep. out there. But some people just don't have access to the funding or the network or the mass distribution channels or the right lobbyists. Mm -hmm. And if we can fundamentally refocus on, are we actually building a better society or are we creating more replicas of each other of things that fundamentally do not matter and actually are harmful when we look at the downstream effects? And those can be huge questions. And it could also be, be a lot to put on people. But I think that part of our responsibility as builders are to provide a, a product in a way that can fit the needs of society that doesn't create too much friction or brain power for people to feel like, I don't want to be seen as a bad person because I didn't put this in the right bin versus why don't we have a system in place that doesn't require you to think about it? You just know that this is going to be happening. You know that the building that you live in is certified lead and it's net zero and it regenerates itself. And during natural disasters, it's already stored all this energy. It's harnessed from the sun, from the solar panels, and it just functions when the lights go out. Like all of those things, like technology is supposed to help us not to have to do all of the mental labor. And yet we're not deploying it at scale. And when I think about like the influencer world and I think about how much I've had, <laughs> I've had, I haven't had way too much time to think about all of this, but there's whole movement around like de-influencing. Like, do we need to buy everything and call it luxury instead of just overconsumption mm. versus focusing our time and our attention on how do we live with what we have right, and enjoy it? And then focus maybe some of our attention on some of the major issues like our literacy rate is falling in the U.S. Mm. Maybe there should be more time and attention spent on tools for education within our neighborhoods, things that we can do to support our local schools. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't know what it is. Like everyone has their own thing and what they're passionate about. But I fundamentally think that there's... There's a challenge when we're not actively aware that our work and our time is so precious. Mm. And if we're not focused in building necessary things, we're going to be sadly mistaken. And, and I mean, we saw this during the pandemic, right? We saw the lack of access to resources. We spent so much time on distraction that when a disaster did strike and there were people without and there were systems without, we didn't even, we, we had to scramble to kind of figure out how to meet needs. And I think I just, I think about that so much. I mean, yes, so, you know, decided to step down from my company, you know, hand it off to someone else. But I also think about like, we went through a whole pandemic during that time period. We went through the highs and lows of isolation, of not having community, of valuing community, of our family dynamics changing of all of these things. Like that was a lot of life in a truncated amount of time. And now coming on the other side of that, you really have to think about like, what happens at the next disaster? What happens at the next pandemic? What place are we gonna be at in society? And it's probably not gonna be the lashes I put on. It's not gonna probably be prioritizing any of the, the, the material things. <laughs> right. And like, and like, don't get me wrong. Cause right. your girl learned how to put her lashes on <laughs> during a pandemic. <laughs> but in terms of the, the, the tools and the resources, and the innovations that are actually going to be so meaningful for our everyday of life, I want to do more thinking about that. And I want to encourage more people to do thinking about that. And I want to help those business owners who are building impact at scale on super necessary and meaningful things. Like I want to help them grow and I want to help them figure this out and get the right connections and relationships. And I think that we could, we could fundamentally change a lot. 
at the end of the day. But that's me in my soapbox and all the things, you know, but you are such a star. Oh my God, you're such a I star. I appreciate you saying that, but I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel guilty. Sometimes I'm like, could I have been spending more time on other things? Like sometimes you're, you never know what your, how your work is going to resonate. Mm -hmm. And it really wasn't until I was saying goodbye that I understood the level in which people had benefited from my work. Right. But during the process, like you're just trying to stay alive. Yeah. You know, you're just trying to wake up and put a smile on your face, you know, maybe after a night of like tears and you got to hop on your Zoom call and be ready for that meeting. You know, you've got to make sure you, you can't let your team see you sweat too much. You know, right. I remember we were in a retreat once. We had like a team retreat. And for some reason, like my body, like I can't feel stress right away, but my body feels it before yep. I recognize it. Correct. And I was breaking out into hives, like during our team retreat. And I like had, I fundamentally like, had to leave to go get medication. And it was just like a week of hives. Of course I was stressed. There's a lot going on. Like I'm in the middle of so many things. And yet, like I'm trying to lead, lead this retreat. I'm trying to close this deal. I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z. And my body is like, sis, you have to slow the hell down, down. and sit down. Like you don't have to carry all of this. But it's like my, my body literally was keeping the score of all of the accumulation of carrying the weight of all the things. Yes. You know? Oh my God. God, this is crazy. So in the short time that you've had an opportunity to sit in the stillness, yeah, what have you found out about yourself? Oh my gosh. I even looking back two years ago, like I'm like, oh my God, it was such a big deal to build the thing, to do the thing. To, and now it's like, I know I can build the thing. Yeah. Like that's, it's yeah, going to happen you're capable. regardless. Yeah. I'm totally capable. Yeah. But it's finding all the nuances and the small things about myself along the way that I'm like, oh, what a mirror this experience is. It is an interesting mirror because I think I think what I'm learning about myself, I don't know if I'm fully solid on what this is truly, but I am so dispassionate about the markers of what success might look like. I feel like I have seen and bought into so many ideals about what it looks like to be brought to the table and what that entails um, from everything that I purchase to how I show up. And while I think those things are important in terms of taking myself seriously, I am so content on not being the, the biggest name or voice in the room. Yes. It's like, I don't, I don't have that desire anymore. I don't have the desire to be on every single stage or at every single table or feel like I have to be the person that saves the day. I think I fundamentally divorced myself from the idea that like what I produce is who I am. Mm. And I think over the course of the last three years, a lot of that has also come from being back and rooted in family and definitely within the context of love. Right. Because in the world, Sherelle has always had to be like whatever version of Sherelle was required for the moment. Correct. But when I'm home, it's like braids up, you know, I'm in my sweats. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm present. Mm -hmm. I'm spending time with my grandparents at the cheesecake factory you know, and we're just, we're just jamming and we're recalling old stories. It's, it's, it's sitting with people, like really sitting with people, like not, I'm trying to network because I'm trying to get to this next level. It is really like, oh yeah, you know, like I, I, like there's just even certain folks who have crossed my path and, you know, and it's like, I remember their kids' names. Oh my God, you're so good at this. You know, it's like because and in, in, in part of that is a journalist in me. It's like I'm fundamentally interested in people and like the reality of people. And we've gotten we get so many versions and, and you know, all of these like hashtags that are defining like what kind of aesthetic you are and this costuming of ourselves. And I realize like I don't want to be a costume of myself. I don't want to have that like 
mon that kind of you know singular look of what a woman in today's society is supposed to be and that doesn't mean that i i'm judging anyone for the the choices that they're making it's just how much energy and effort do i want to put into being an idealized version of whatever society says especially as a woman i'm supposed to be and how i'm supposed to show up or what a boss is like or all of these things and it's like this is this is crazy. I am confused every day. Like, <laughs> are we not supposed to? Are we? Are we supposed to say? Oh, sometimes I just shut the phone and I'm like, I can't. Yeah, I'm like, no. Uh, uh, uh-uh. I'll get stuck. It's too many things, and we what we don't realize is that we are participating in groupthink on a larger scale, and we're not really thinking about what we're building because we're just aiming for this idea of the material things without any regard to what that says about our humanity. And I had to go way back. I had to go way back, just like, I was telling this story once on Instagram about how, you know, after losing my job right out of college, I had to go home to Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I had to like sleep on my aunt's sofa. You know, I had to go back to teaching tap. I hadn't taught tap since I was a teenager. Cause I was like, I got to hustle up some cash. I got these student loans to pay, you know, what have you. And I'm trying to regroup. And at some point I end up, you know, house sitting for this woman in Santa Monica, like never met her, met her on Craigslist. And I was like, I'm going to stay at your place and walk your dog. And you stay, stay doing crazy things <laughs> all the day long. And I had like a friend from college. She like commented under it. She's like, I remember that because I stayed with you for like three days. And I was like, oh my God, you're so right. And it was like going back to those moments of the Sherelle that was unsure, but still fearless and was still so rooted in who she was. And being okay with not knowing what was next. Maybe I wasn't okay. Maybe maybe I was still in my crisis then. But it was like, but this is my yeah. shit, right? Like, and this is my coming. shit. It's and it's fine. It's going to be fine. Like, I'm not going to die. And recognizing, like, where I come from, the people who built me, the people who ensured my success, those are my people. Those are my people. So regardless of what I participate in, like, who I am at my root when I am in that mirror, when I am, when all the cameras and all the all the things are gone, I am Jerry Dorsey's granddaughter. I am Kikora Dorsey's daughter. I was built by a community in Seattle that put together money to give me a laptop to go away to college. You know, like I'm I am built by the people who welcomed me into their home and 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 you know and fed me you know, mm. or, you know, mentors who let me stay in there, you know, their beautiful condos when, you know, I'm like shacking up with some roommates, to expose you know, me. Yep. to expose me, who sent me to Paris and Barcelona and, you know, showed me the world and continue to show love and kindness and community beyond any of the successes, right? Like, like the, the folks who will literally pick up the phone, like, Hey, like, I want to invite you to my baby shower. I want, I want you to, you know, I want you to, you know, check in with my kids because they love you so much or what have you. Like I, I call one of my, um, my mentors, like he's like a big brother to me. He's got four daughters. It's like, every time I come home, they're like, auntie rail, auntie rail. Like we're going to go do this. We're going to do that. I'm like, yeah. And but like the, the four-year-old was like, well, I can come and live with you after I finish college. And I was like, okay, girl, <laughs> I got you. Absolutely. Not. I got you. <laughs> I got, you can do some laundry, but you got yeah. to go. Mm-hmm. And I just, I think that those are the biggest rewards for me of mm. this journey is the lifelong relationships. And even for some that aren't necessarily lifelong, like the actual being seen and being able to see. You are so intentional about relationships. I really try because it's what grounds me, mm. you know, and even in romantic relationships where if you can't be 100% of yourself, because, you know, when you're visible, folks like the idea of you. Love it. Yeah. But when you start being a real, actual human being, it's like, oh, I, I was, I'm not here for that. 
No, yeah. Go bring back. Go I like back the version there, of you back. online. I like yeah, the yeah. version of you that runs a business. But right. this, this girl at home, I don't know about all this. I don't this. know what this is. <laughs> go back You're in not there that great and bring out the ground. <laughs> right, right, right. And so it's like love is blind. That's what you look like outside. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Like I, I didn't sign up for this. And being so comfortable with the vulnerability that comes with true intimate partnership, true intimate relationships, and doing what you can to protect those and sustain those because they ground you. And they remind you that all of these things can happen and you can be sitting in in the best of rooms. And at the end of the day, like you have safe spaces to land, whether or not you get those rooms or not. And what we have to also remember is like, we're not in those rooms just for ourselves. They're for other people. Yes. So it's not enough to just be like, oh, hey, look, look what I did and look who I am and all these kinds of things. It's like, what did you do with the power that you had? Did you provide an opportunity? And like I posted to Instagram a while ago, like um, Brian Burkeen is a is a friend and an incredible founder and investor. And he he had this tweet. He's like, you know, there are two people in the world, those who have to make payroll and those who get paid. And it was the realest thing I, I had ever it. seen. I was like, y'all don't understand. Y'all don't understand. It is a, sh- it is a we struggle. We have all had the days where it was like, I do not have it. And not what even, did we not do even wrong? Don't, I don't have it, but especially when you're dealing, because, you know, sometimes we've got, we got bad hires or we aren't working with folks who, we are, we're working with folks who have the audacity. And I'm like, you do recognize that I'm paying you for and the you money I go out and hunt and get. And you didn't right? do anything this week. Right. But you're going to get a check. Yeah. I may not get a check, but you're going to get a check for sure. Uh, for for sure. all the times I've paid you and not myself. For all of the times. Yep. For all of the times. And I don't think that people understand that level of sacrifice and leadership it takes to keep your word to people who have who have trusted you mm. with a vision and with a dream. I just think about like this entire journey has been so eye-opening and you have to have the grounding to feel the confidence of like, yeah, I can build. Like I knocked this out of the park. I I built this. I did this. And now I don't have anything to prove to anyone. I don't have shit to prove. When you stop proving everything around you gets so much better. Yeah. You just said that. And I'm like, <laughs> in this season of my life, my favorite thing on planet. Like I'm like, I think about how I used to be in force to be so loud. Mm. And now I'm like, my favorite thing to do in life is like on a Friday night. Yeah. I pick up my son and we go to my best friend's house Yeah, with her and her fiance and we all make dinner while my son runs around the house and we all take part in that role and we have an incredible yeah. conversation and we laugh and we stay up and I let my son stay up on the Friday night and play with all three of us. And I'm like, this is what life is supposed yeah. to be. Both have to matter. Exactly. But this matters the most. Yeah. This. This, this moment, the presentness matters. Yes. We create trends out of everything and like mindfulness and all these kinds of things and they become fads and it's like, no, it really is just about being present. And I think that that's where the stepping down and the deciding to say it's time for a pivot, it's time for a reinvention because seven years into something, you're a completely different person. We're compl- we're a completely different person every six months. Correct. <laughs> like my skin I'm changes all the time. <laughs> Everything is changing. Yeah, who I was seven years ago, I am not. I'm not I'm the never same person I was last year. No, I'm not driven by the same things. Some of the things that I thought mattered a lot matter very little. Yeah. Some of the things that I thought were very insignificant are now not very important. significant. And how do I now make space and make room for this version of myself that I am becoming and that I have worked towards becoming? But still in figuring out, you know, and allowing that to be okay, because now my narrative is changing. And my narrative doesn't necessarily include this one singular thing, especially when I look at the context of a lifetime, a a lifetime lifetime of invention of myself. Like a lifetime. We can't expect people to be innovators and to continuously do the exact same thing. So here's my last question. Yeah. You've made this decision. What is done is done. It is It is what it is. It is the best it is decision. What it, is. it is what it is. <laughs> we already know, based yeah. off this conversation, that you are going to do something profound after this. Yeah, girl. You are going to do something greater and do it faster and do it better than you did the last time. Mm-hmm. That is done. That is already mm-hmm. in the, the atmosphere. But what are you going to do different for you? 
this time around? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, um, I feel like I've started a little bit. It is like true intentional breaks. One of the things that I realized I want to do more of, and, um, I, at the top of 2023, one of my biggest goals was to learn how to love better. Mm. Like truly what, what, did, what is love in action? And I, so I start off the year reading, um, Danielle Lap- Laporte's how to be loving. Yeah. And I think a lot about do people in my life know that I truly love them? Mm. Not just like, Hey, love you. What have you? But through my actions, does my mom feel like she is significant in my life? Even if I don't speak to her every day, that I check in, that I share something about my life, that I ask her about her life, that I ask her about how she's feeling about anything, right? That she feels like, oh, you're making a concerted effort. I know you're traveling all around the world, but like, oh, you just invited me to dinner so we can spend some time together. Like these little things that make people feel safe and valued, have I created, as much as I want that space from other people, Mm. have I created that space? Have I said, hey, yo, like, just come to the house. Like, let me make you dinner. Let's just, let's just spend time together. I think especially in doing the kind of work that we do and the way that we do it, yeah. sometimes family feels like you're off limits because, oh, you're so busy. And it's like, no, I'm not busy. If you call me, I'll call you back. Mm. If I'm in a meeting, I'm going to call you back. You know, making people feel wanted. You know, there's sometimes, especially when we're in isolation and, and especially sometimes when you're an entrepreneur, Sometimes you feel like people don't get it. You know, you get to those dark moments of like, I feel alone or, yeah. you know, you get to the space of functional depression. Yeah. You know, where you're just, you're going through the motions, you're grinding. Sometimes you're taking hit after hit after hit before you get a win. And that can be rough. And so if it's rough for me, imagine everyone else and the stuff that they may be going through. And just imagine like, hey, I don't know what you're doing today, but I was at the market and I bought some apples and I thought about you. I'm going to come bring you some apples, girl. Or, you know, wh- whatever it is, like, how do I pour myself into not just the next thing, but the people that I want to make sure before they leave this planet, that they knew that that I loved them. And so that for me is like that ongoing work. It's, it's in how you speak to people, how you greet people, how you remember people and little things. It might, again, it might just be a text message. Like, hey, happy birthday. I hope you enjoy. I was thinking of you. And it seems so simplistic, but when your blinders are on and you're in building mode, sometimes you forget that. And then you'll get all of these like super famous, super wealthy CEOs who write their books about, you know, how much they wish they would have invested in their relationships. And, you know, now they're now they're selling you a course on how to invest <laughs> in your relationships. And you're like, seriously? Okay. And so yeah, that for me is how I feel like I am going to do differently in taking care of myself because in turn, I have the kind of community that I need, especially when the going gets tough, but I also have the kind of community I need that's going to continue to pour into my success. And I don't want to say success from like a business standpoint, but my success as a person. As a person, even in relationships, like when you've cultivated the right relationships and people know who you are and fundamentally your goals for yourself and you're having challenges, they're going to keep speaking life into you. Oh, yeah, y'all are capable of this. Yep. I know you're upset about this, but y'all are going to figure it out. You know, all of that requires a, a strong foundation of loving well and then allowing yourself to be loved and for me, that's that's how I'm going to enter into this next phase very differently. I have to give an ode to you before we end this. And I think everybody listening outside of you just being one of the most incredible women I've ever known. I literally this episode is making so me want to cry. <laughs> I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> I'm like, you all should be listening to this. And all I can think about is, wow, what a mistake I've made or what the audacity I've had to not be more intentional about my life. Mm-hmm. This is all intentionality. Mm-hmm. You are intentional about the way you love. You are an intentional. You're intentional about the way you treat yourself. You're intentional about the way you do business. And I'm sitting here thinking about like the emptiness I've felt lately. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it's intention and purpose. Yeah. I have lost the intentionality behind what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And I've lost the intentionality behind the way I love. Like mm-hmm. these things matter. Yeah. 
Yeah. And if you guys are listening to this, like everything about this episode just reeks. This is an episode all about reinvention. It doesn't have to be that you have to make this massive pivot or do this entire 360 or ditch everything you've built. Sometimes it's just about like with what I have, how can I be more intentional? That's it. It's not anything extra drastic, right? It is ongoing examination and also learning from how others, like I pick up things from just how other people move in their lives. And you borrow a little from here and a little from there and you, you unlearn a little bit here and then you learn a little bit here and then you give yourself grace because we're human and we have hormones and sometimes like shit is not good. Right. You know? And then sometimes like you're just rocking in your car, having a great day. And then the next time, you know, it's just, you have to deal with the ebbs and flows of life. However, as long as I think we're committed to examination and say, huh, something doesn't feel quite right. I, I do, I do want to be more intentional about this, this, and this. What does that look like? And then allowing yourself to time to figure yourself the time to figure that out. I think that's what our ongoing work is. Because again, like no one has it down perfect. Mm-hmm. It's just once we start to get that feeling in our core and our spirit, it's like, okay, let me listen. Let me listen, God, universe, what have you. Maybe I need to, I need to move a little different. Mm. maybe I need a little bit more stillness. And even now, even when you, you ask about what, what am I going to do differently? I came from the world of difficult takes a day, impossible takes a week. You know, working in tech, it's like you don't wait, you don't stop, you don't think. You just go and then you figure it out on the back As end later, go. which can be great, which can be great because it removes fear. However, in this next iteration for me, it is I actually do want to take the time to think about what I'm thinking about. And I want to ask questions and I want to sit with folks and I want to do the research. And I don't want to just jump into something. I really, really want to be, back to your point, intentional about what I build next and giving myself the necessary amount of time. Because especially immediately following my email, it was like all the offers, all the phone calls. Yeah. Can you come over here? Can you come do this? I'm like, I'm going to the Bahamas. I'm going to call you back. Yeah. And I'm not going to call you back immediately. And I'm not going to take my, I took my laptop with me to the Bahamas, but I, I would just like, the only thing I did was like my, I had a, a, a campaign with like Zendesk. I just wrapped that up and that was like fun. And I was like, I'm not emailing anyone back. I'm not getting phone calls because there's no urgency. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm chilling. Nothing in my life needs to be urgent. No, because when the right opportunity presents itself, it's going to be really exciting. I don't want to just take something because I feel like, oh, well, I have to do something. I have to be able to say I'm attached to this and I need the big title to walk into the big room. It's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm just me. Like you asked me earlier, like, like what, 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 how should I, introduce? like, it's me. I'm it's just, just here. Me. I'm just out here. Like, and I'm perfectly okay with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. I am now a couple of days following the announcement. I was like, oh shit. What do I do now? I just, I just dropped a bomb. I can't be like, y'all, I'm just playing. <laughs> like, <laughs> now I got to ride this way. I got to commit. Yep. Like I told everybody I was peacing out, like got to commit. And so, yeah, it's like, okay, I got to be intentional this next time in a different way than I was with all of my previous work. Cause I had an intention for that. And then sometimes your intention changes, right? Especially as you build differently. Right. Sometimes the mission changes. You know, you got to think about, like, I think about like Apple. Apple started with this Macintosh computer and then you fast forward 30 years and you're like, okay, you've got all of these. Everything. New things. Yep. Right. Because you have to update the mission. Mm. We got to do that for ourselves over and over and over again. That's why reinvention is important. And, And it's like, yeah, like we do get to reinvent ourselves. Like we do not have to stay in the same space, but grace Grace is still required through that process. So I hope you give yourself some grace. Oh my God. <laughs> this was so good, Sherelle. I got to say the same thing your investor said. I'm proud of you. Thank you. It means a I'm lot. I'm proud to be a witness to it. Thank you. I'm proud to see someone choose themselves. I'm proud to see someone put the stick down and be like, that's enough. Yeah. Like it's decide. I always, I always say like learning that I had to redefine success and then mm-hmm. learning I had to decide what was enough. Mm-hmm. What's enough to be proud of? Because otherwise I'm going to keep coming up empty handed. Yeah. And it was like, you just said, yeah, I did enough. What is enough? And I'm so yeah. proud to be witness to it. I'm so thankful Thank that you, you shared it with us. Thank you for giving me space to share. Yes. Thanks and 
tell everybody where they can keep up with you now. Absolutely. I'm, I'm producing content. Writing is still, uh, you know, a first love for me. Um, you know, obviously please make sure you listen to subscribe the road to, to the road to reinvention. Um, my podcast that I shoot with my, my lovely Jess here <laughs> and, um, and then Sherelle Dorsey.com. Um, that's the best place to check out all my existing work, my, my projects. And then, getting to my email list because mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be sharing more about some of my reflections, yeah. what I've learned, you know, the, the way I was able to raise over a million dollars in grants, you know, and just, you know, funding a business without capital, you know, to start like just lessons learned that I want to share and be honest about um, and opportunities to also work together with folks who are intentional and trying to build meaningful things where I can be a support. Like I want to mm. also open the door to that as well. So Cheryl Dorsey.com. Y'all this woman is amazing. And now yeah. you get to see why. <laughs> ah. Cheryl, thank you so much. Thank you. And guys, I will catch you on the next episode of rich in real life. <laughs>